Let's turn in God's Word to John chapter 1. We're going to be focusing our attention on verses 9 to 13 this morning as we consider responses to the light, rejection or reception, but I'm going to read the whole of John's prologue, verses 1 through 18. This is God's holy word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not know receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, please write your word on our hearts that we might see Jesus, the living word, the light of the world. We might truly receive him, believing in his name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes a writer feels the need to write themselves into the story. Dorothy Sayers was an English mystery writer Uh, from the 1920s to 50s. She was a close friend of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, although she was not uh, a member of the famed Inklings. That was the same literary circle that she uh, was, was in. And her most famous series of books is the Lord Peter Whimsey Mysteries, and she's kind of regarded as one of the four queens of mystery fiction, along with Agatha Christie and, and a couple of others. But Peter Whimsey is is the gentleman detective. He's wealthy, he's intelligent, he's insightful, he's witty, but he's also very lonely. Through all of his traveling around and, and solving mysteries and engaging in witty banter, he had no one to love him. And so about halfway through her series of books and stories, Sayers knew that Whimsey needed someone in his life to fill the emptiness. So she wrote in a female character, Harriet Vane. Harriet was a writer of detective fiction and one of the first women to graduate from Oxford. Sayers could write Harriet very well because she herself was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford and a writer of detective fiction. Yes, Harriet saw Peter's need and wrote herself into the story to be the one to make Peter's life complete. Now, as a Christian, Dorothy Sayers must have realized that what she was doing was an echo, a very faint imitation of what the author of life himself had done 2,000 years ago. In the middle of the story of the world that he created, the true light 
which gives light to everyone, the word himself in whom is life and whose life is the light of men wrote himself into the story. He came into our world because he knew that he was what we needed to fix our brokenness and make us complete. Now, I might say that in Dorothy Sayers' Peter Whimsey stories, Peter and Harriet, they do end up getting married. But perhaps if Sayers had really wanted to reflect what happened when the author of life wrote himself into the story, Lord Peter would have looked at Harriet and said, who do you think you are? How did you get here? Where do you get off thinking you can just walk into my life? I don't need you. You're a threat to my independence. And maybe he would even do away with her. Because that's how the world responded to Jesus. But the good news is, that wasn't the response of everyone. While the world did not know him and his own people refused to receive him, there are those who receive him and who believe in his name. And just as Peter and Harriet's story led to a wedding, so too the story of Jesus and the people who receive him is also leading to the same wonderful conclusion, the great wedding feast of the Lamb when Christ will take his bride to himself forevermore. So let's walk through this text together. Verses 9 and 10 tell us the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Now think about the astonishing reality of that fact. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. What, is, what does John mean by the world? Well, John uses the word world a lot in his writing. It's, it's the Greek word cosmos. We, uh, we get our word cosmic from that. And uh, he, he kind of means two different things by it. John sometimes means the whole of the world, which is all of creation, which is God's creation, and which is good, although it is broken because it has fallen and it is now marred by the shadow of death and decay. And so, as Paul would write in Romans 8, the creation was subjected to bondage, to decay, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope that it too would be liberated. So sometimes John has that version of the world in mind, the whole of creation. But at other times, and probably more commonly, what John means by the world are the people in the world. And the people in the world are also God's good creation, in fact, made in his image. But... Unlike the rest of creation, which has just fallen and broken through no fault of its own, the people in the world are in active rebellion against God. They, in fact, hate God and do not want God to be part of their story or for them to be part of God's story. They are fallen and dead in sin, blind to spiritual truth, and trapped in the darkness of ignorance and unbelief. And so here John is telling us that although the whole world all of creation was made through the Word, that when the Word took on flesh, the light that gives light to everyone came into the world, the people in the world did not know him. If you read the Gospels, one thing that should stand out to you is that the creation does in fact recognize its maker and master. Repeatedly throughout the Gospels, you see Jesus calming storms, healing the sick, even raising the dead, casting out demons. On the night when he was born, the angelic host sang of the glory to God and the goodwill to those on earth who would belong to Christ. And yet, the people in the world don't get it. They don't see it. People often ask about Jesus, who is this? One place we see this is in Luke chapter 7. A, a sinful woman comes to Jesus and washes his feet with her tears and dries them with her hair. And Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who are at the table began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, 
Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. They didn't realize who their dinner guest was. The woman seemed to get it, but they didn't. But it wasn't just Jesus' enemies. Even his own disciples did not recognize him through most of his earthly ministry. In Mark chapter 4, we have Jesus in a storm with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, and he's, he's fallen asleep in, in the back of the boat, his head resting on a cushion. The storm is tossing the boat, and these experienced fishermen who had been out on the Sea of Galilee all of their lives are scared for their lives because the boat is being swamped by the waves, and they're wondering, why in the world is he sleeping? How can he sleep through this? What is wrong with this guy? Now, Sean Troutman can sleep through anything, but I think even he would have woken up in this storm. But there's Jesus asleep, and the disciples wake him up in a panic, and he gets up, and he simply rebukes the wind and the sea with two words, peace, quiet. And immediately, the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, immediately. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were now filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The sea and the wind, they knew their maker and their master. They responded to his voice instantly. But the disciples who'd spent so much time with him, who had seen him do miracles, who had sat at his feet listening to his teaching, they didn't know who they were following. And the irony gets even thicker when you realize that even the demons recognized Jesus and obeyed him. Right after that story of the calming of the storm, they get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and they go out into a place called the Gerasenes, and there's a demon-possessed man who's lived among the tombs, and he comes out, and he has an unclean spirit, and he's lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he would, he would wrench the chains apart, and he would break the shackles in pieces. No one had strength to subdue him. That's how utterly possessed by demonic power he was. Night and day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, Mark 5 tells us, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. The demons knew who he was. But his own disciples didn't, and his enemies didn't. All of creation, from the food, to the leprosy, to the storms, to the demons, to the angels, all knew him, yet people made by him in his image, made for relationship with him, did not know him. Verse 11 takes it one step further. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. This isn't just talking about people in general. This is talking about his own people, his covenant people, the people who had been given the word of God in written form, the word of God spoken through the prophets. Now here is that word of God in flesh among them, and they don't just not know him. They do not receive him. That's a stronger language. That's a language of rejection, not just ignorance. The first stunning example of this comes right after the birth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. We know the story. It's the coming of the wise men from the east. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. Now when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshiped him. Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. These wise men from the East, they weren't part of the people of God. They didn't have the full revelation of God's word. They must have had bits and pieces. Maybe they were in a school of magi that had been started by Daniel hundreds of years earlier when he was in uh, Persia. They're probably from the Persian area of present-day Iran, most likely. We don't know for sure. But these men, they knew enough to look for a star. Perhaps they even knew of the prophecy of Balaam, who was a very famous prophet in the Middle East. And he's told of how a star would rise in Jacob's house. A scepter would come from Israel. But whatever the reason, they knew to be looking for a sign, and they saw the sign, and they traveled a thousand miles to find the newborn king of the Jews, not even their own king. And yet, even though the people of God had much clearer and more specific prophecy, even though the people of God had been waiting for over 700 years since Micah had prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and even though the wise men come a thousand miles, Bethlehem is five miles from Jerusalem. The chief priests and the scribes, whose job it is to know the scriptures and teach the people, they know the answer to the question when Herod asks them, where is the Messiah to be born? Oh, in Bethlehem, in Judea. It's right there in the prophet Micah. They quote the Bible. They can quote the Bible chapter and verse. They know the answers to the theological questions, but they won't go five miles to worship their long-awaited Messiah. They just let Herod deal with the wise men. And in fact, about a year later, they let Herod just issue a decree to kill all the babies in Bethlehem. And we have no record of them raising an objection or trying to protect the babies of Bethlehem or doing anything. Why? Because they were comfortable and complacent with their political position, and they knew that they had to appease the Romans to keep their place, and that was more important to them than their king. As we continue through the Gospels, we see this over and over again. Anytime Jesus threatens to upset the power structure, the authorities get very concerned. It comes to a climax, an almost absurd climax, with the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. I mean, you would think, if anything, would sort of open your eyes and make you see that you're wrong to reject this guy. It's if maybe dozens of people are there, present, eyewitnesses, to see him raise a man who's been four days in the tomb and everybody knows was four days in the tomb. But that's not what happened. John 11 tells us many of the Jews who had come with Mary and saw what he did believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council together. This is the Jewish ruling council, the same group that would condemn Jesus to death just a short time later. They come together and they say, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They knew he did the signs. Like they never denied that he was doing signs. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, 
but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. The leadership, not even knowing that they were actually carrying out God's will, but they chose their political power, their position, their prestige, their comfort, their power over God and over his Messiah. People themselves proved to be no better than their leaders when, at the trial of Jesus, they demanded the release of Barabbas, who had been an insurrectionist. And when asked, what should I do with Jesus, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Even on the cross, those who passed by mocked him and derided him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. R.C. Sproul would say, the most powerful word in the Bible is the first word of verse 12, but, but. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The world didn't recognize him, his own people didn't receive him, but some did. The wise men from the east, the woman who had a sinful past. So often it was the most unlikely. Fishermen, tax collectors. They were able to see. John tells us, it's those who receive him, who believe in his name, who are given the right or authority or power, it's the same word that means right, authority, power, to become children of God. John's trying to make clear what it means to receive Jesus. It means to believe in his name. But I think if you were to ask him, well, what does it mean to believe in his name? He would say, well, it means to receive him. What is this? Well, John's telling us that what we need is true and saving faith. A faith that believes, to believe in his name means to believe in who Jesus is. And to receive him means to receive him for who he is. And that's very different from what some people think is faith. Because it's possible for people to come to Jesus and Make a motion of receiving him, and yet for all the wrong reasons and in all the wrong ways. There were large crowds who followed Jesus. They would often crowd around so that no one could even get near the house where Jesus was teaching. So that after a time, he had to go out into the countryside because the towns where he would go in would become so crowded full of people that there was no possible way. There were large crowds that came to Jesus. But what did they come for? Were they coming believing who he really is? Were they coming to receive him for who he really was? Why were they coming? Here's the miracle man. He heals people with a word, with a touch. And he did. He, he would patiently heal people, but then he would teach them. And John 6 tells us of, of one time when Jesus was teaching people out on the countryside, and they've been out there all day, and the disciples are asking him to please send the people away so that they can go and get some bread, some food to eat, because they're out here, and they've been out here all day. And Jesus says to his disciples, why don't you give them something to eat? And they said, I think they looked down at the money that they had in the money box, and they counted it all up, and it was, I think, 200 denarii, and they said, 200 denarii wouldn't be enough to buy food for everyone to get one mouthful. Jesus says, okay, just watch. <laughs> and he takes one boy's lunch, and he multiplies it to feed the 5,000, and there's 12 baskets full of food left over, and then he goes, 
But this is very interesting. John 6, all four Gospels record the feeding of the 5,000. It's actually the one miracle, other than the, the resurrection of Jesus, it's the one miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels. Very significant. But John alone tells us what happened afterwards. Afterwards, Jesus you know, goes back across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum to his basically what had become his hometown, his base of operations, and he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath to worship, and the whole crowd figures out where he is, and they come and find him. And Jesus says to them, this is John 6, 26, Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. <laughs> Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus tells them, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the bread. And we might think, well, isn't that the same thing? Wasn't the multiplying of the bread the sign? How they ate the bread, but they didn't see the sign? What does that mean? Well, a sign is something that points to a reality beyond itself. Right? When we share in the Lord's Supper, we have the bread and the wine, and those are signs. And you could take those, and you could eat, and you could drink, and you could not see the sign if you don't understand that it's pointing you to Jesus. And that's what Jesus is saying. You came to get food, but not the real food that I'm offering. Even when they say in verse 34, sir, give us this bread always, what they want is free food every day. Just like Moses gave the Israelites. They had heard these stories all their lives. For 40 years, God provided free food every day. Wouldn't that be great? No more having to pray, give us this day our daily bread, because man, it's going to be there every day. You don't have to work anymore. You could just sort of. But Jesus was coming to give them something so much better, and that is himself. Himself. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. You see, so often people come to Jesus because they want something from Jesus. And so they'll believe in Jesus because they think it's a way to get something from Jesus. I sometimes wonder how many in the crowd of 5,000 who were fed that day by Jesus were later in the crowd in Jerusalem shouting, crucify him. If you come to Jesus for what you want from him and not for him, not only are you going to be wrong, but you're going to be disappointed because Jesus is not going to be your heavenly genie or your super Santa Claus. What do I mean? Well, you know, some people come to Jesus because they want him to heal all their sicknesses and make them healthy and wealthy. It's very sad to me 
sometimes I've heard, I've heard this story several different times from several different people of, well, I was a Christian and I trusted Jesus, but I prayed for my mother's healing from cancer and God didn't answer that prayer. And so I gave up. And it's sad to me. Part of the reason why it's sad to me is because that could have been me. <laughs> when I was 11 years old, I prayed for God to heal my grandmother from cancer. And God didn't answer that prayer the way that I expected. And I was very devastated by that. But you see, that means we're interested in God as long as he answers our prayers the way that we expect him to answer our prayers. So are we really interested in him? Some people come to Jesus because he will fill them with self-esteem and help them feel better about themselves. Some people come to Jesus to win the culture war and gain political power. This is why Emperor Constantine and so many so-called Christian rulers who followed in his footsteps professed faith in Jesus because it, he, they knew that it would gain them a following that was committed and could help them secure their political position. Others come to Jesus to bless their pursuit of the American dream or to give them a happy marriage and good children. This is one reason why we will not follow the seeker-driven model of church growth that says preach to people about their felt needs and about how Jesus is the answer to meet their felt needs. If you're lonely, come for the love of God. If you're poor, come and manage your life by biblical financial principles. If you're looking for a good marriage relationship, come to our singles group and learn biblical principles of marriage and you will have a happy marriage. We don't do that. And we won't ever do that. Because that is pushing a Santa Claus Jesus. That is saying, your life has something missing. Jesus will give it to you. No, Jesus gives you something so much better. Jesus will give you himself. Himself. He is what you need. To those who would look to Jesus for some selfish benefit, even, let me go so far as to say, even those who would say, I'm going to come to Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. That's so much better. And I know Jesus is the only way to get there. So I'm going to go to Jesus so I can get out of hell and I can get into heaven. Well, what is that? Is Jesus is standing up in heaven, handing out get out of jail free cards, you know. He gives you himself. And you, if you receive him, you receive him. If you believe in his name, you believe in his name. And so to all of those who are coming to Jesus with some selfish benefit in mind, Jesus would say this, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the God the Father has set his seal. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Jesus is Lord of all. He's the light of the world. He's the Savior of sinners. He's the gift of heaven, and he himself is our true eternal life. The express gift of the goodness of God. The embodiment of the steadfast love of the Lord. To receive him. To believe in him is to have life and light. Not what he gives you, but himself. And that's what it means to trust in him. Where do you get that kind of saving faith? How, how does someone, someone come to Jesus and say, I know that I've been taught all my life that I need to look out for number one, I need to get what I can get, and I can't approach you with that sort of mindset. I have to just... Lay that aside and trust you and believe in you and receive you for you. Where does that kind of faith come from? It's totally counter to human nature and to the culture. Well, John, Jesus said it in John 6, 37. He said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. 
Later in verse 44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. In Matthew 16, it's Peter who makes the first public Christian profession of faith. He says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answers him and says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for you were smart enough to figure it out. Nope. You had pure enough eyes to see the truth. Nope. He said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The Father gives us to the Son, the Father draws us to the Son, the Father gives us knowledge of the Son. It's his grace. And that's what John means when he says that those who have the right to become children of God are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. As Jesus himself would later say to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you're here this morning, and your eyes have been opened, and you have come to Jesus with true and saving faith, if you know that Jesus is what you need, then thank the Lord, because he's been gracious to you. But if you're here this morning, and you think, I don't know, I hear about Jesus, I hear other people talk about how wonderful he is. I understand what you're saying he did, feeding the 5,000 and raising Lazarus from the dead and dying on the cross for my sins and rising again from the dead. I understand all of that intellectually, but I, I just don't know. I just don't know if I'm ready to come to him for him. Maybe if he can help me out a little bit, I might trust him a little bit more. This is where that sort of emergency faith comes from sometimes. Oh, Lord, if you just get me out of this. I promise you I'm not going to miss a church Sunday ever again. That's not saving faith. That's, that's, a, that's a, if you give me, then I will. If you're here and you don't know, what I would invite you to do, what I would urge you to do, is to cry out to him. Say, Lord, I need you. I know intellectually that I need you. But I don't know if I'm trusting in you. Would you draw me to yourself? Would you change my heart? Would you give me true and saving faith? Would you rescue me from me? If you will cry out to him, that will be evidence that he's actually working in your heart. And that's why he always answers that prayer, because it's a prayer that he puts in your heart and draws forth from your lips. Lord, save me. Lord, have mercy on me. That means you're coming to him, not with conditions, not because you're looking for something from him, but you need him and you're casting all of your weight on him. You know, the Bible gives us the image of marriage for this for a very good reason. Marriage as it was designed by God, marriage as it's supposed to work, is supposed to be an earthly picture of that heavenly reality. And it should look like this. We stand up in front of God and witnesses, we take vows, and we say, I'm in this as long as I'm getting from you what I need. No. That's the way our culture acts, though, isn't it? We stand up and we say, I take you to be my wife, for better or worse, sickness and health, richer or poorer, till death do us part. I take you to be mine and I give myself to be yours. Not because of what I can get from you,
but because I love you and I want you and I need you. That's what it is to come to Christ with saving faith. And he really is what we need because he's the one who made us and he made us for himself. And as Pascal said, there's a God-shaped void in the heart of every human being. And if it's God-shaped, you can throw the whole universe into it and it wouldn't even start to fill it. God alone is the one our souls were made for. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son, the true light of the world, the light who enlightens everyone, who came into the world to give us light and life, and that life is in him. It's not from him, it's in him. Father, I pray that we would come to Jesus with true and saving faith now and always, today and forever, that every day we would say, Lord, I am yours and you are mine. You are all my soul needs. I trust in you. Help me to trust in you more. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. And our eyes at last shall see him through his own redeeming love. For that child so dear and gentle is our Lord in heaven above, and he leads his children on to the place where he is gone. As a final charge, consider this. If you were brought by the grace of God into eternal paradise, where there would be no more sin, no more sickness, no more dying, but no Jesus. Would that be heaven? Would that be what your heart is longing for? Receive the Lord's blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Grace be with all of you. Amen.